Um, hi everyone, my name is Cher. I'm currently a postdoc at King's College. And today I'm gonna talk about a, pro a project I did during my PhD at Imperial, um, which is investigating image synthesis using convolutional capsule GANs. So during my PhD, we collected a data set of axons using two phytomicroscopy. And this kind of data is often used in neuroscience to study things like synaptic plasticity and neuronal function. And to do this, we want to one, segment the axon and detect the synapses. So these methods actually kind of go hand in hand where we can segment the axon and actually extract the synapse location using the axon backbone intensity. So in order to improve the method of segmentation, we aim to use deep learning. However, we have a quite small data set. So our approach is to increase the amount of training data using uh, deep uh, generative uh, methods in order to improve on the task of segmentation. And we do this using um, conditional GANs trained on real data. Um, in addition, we develop a new method um, of a GAN generator using convolutional capsules. So once we have a, a trained GAN generator, we use, um, we use the GAN to synthesize additional data and use that as augmentation um, using either real or synthetic labels. So um, in our paper, um, we use uh, two different data sets. So one is a real data set collected using two photon microscopy in the mouse. Um, so here we see at the top the segmentation maps that we um, manually label. And um, below that, we see the real data, which can have a variation number of axons. Um, and in addition, they would have um, uh, the synapses, which are called boutons on the axons. In addition, we use a synthetic model. Um, so this synthetic model is based on random walks in 2D space. Um, and then in addition, we have a physics-based appearance-based model, which makes um, these labels that you see um, there look more uh, realistic like axons. So in terms of the real data, we use um, this data to train our GAN um, synthetic model in order to um, learn a representation between this binary segmentation map um, and to be able to represent real axons. Um, our synthetic model is actually um, can be used as input into the scan generator as well. So these um, synthetic labels can also be used as input to the GAN, um, which will enable us to generate um, an infinite number of labels. In addition, these two data sets are used as baseline models um, later on in our segmentation tasks that we use to evaluate our synthetic generations from the GANs. So a GAN is built of a, a generator network and discriminator network. Um, so our, our generator network is a conditional um, generator, so it takes in as input um, the segmentation label. So the segmentation label can either be from uh, the real um, manual uh, labels or also from our synthetic um, model, which we call SSM. In addition, this network takes in a latent vector Z, which will control the output, um, the synthetic image. Our discriminator network is actually also a conditional network and takes in as input a pair of real or fake images. So in the case here, we see um, um, a binary image a segmentation map and the real image, and it would just classify that as real or fake and will help us train our generator. So I previously mentioned that we use convolutional capsules as our generator network. So first of all, why would we want to use capsules at all? Um, so capsules were first introduced um, in 2017 uh, by Sabor and Jeffrey Hinton um, as a way to tackle problems with CNNs. So in CNNs, um, one of the biggest problems is that it's unable to learn spatial relations between features. So um, we, we see this image here of a face, and we can clearly tell this is a face, but we know for sure that um, this image is not a face, as the eye and the mouth should not be here on the top. However, a CNN might still classify that as a face, since it doesn't actually capture um, how these features are related in space. 
So capsules were introduced in order to capture um, this relationship using a big weight matrix, which encodes the spatial relation. Another property of capsules that is really important to learn relationship between features is the use of dynamic routing. And dynamic routing um, works by propagating um, inputs on the fly, as in to encode them in different capsules. However, the problem of these capsules is that the big weight matrix that I mentioned is very uh, memory intensive, and that's why we haven't really seen this much in the literature since it's limited um, in the size of the images it can use. Um, in the original paper, they used uh, the MNIST data set, which is around 28 by 28 in pixel size. So last year, convolutional capsules um, were introduced um, in actually in middle um, by Lalanda et al. And um, they uh, proposed a way of using um, the power of dynamic routing, capturing relationships between features, but reducing the computation by um, removing this big weight matrix and replacing it with a convolution, which will allow it to be applied to much larger images and allow the analysis of these filters as well. So this is a relatively unexplored area of research. And um, this paper is the first application of capsules to a GAN generator. Um, so how do capsules actually work? So the input into the capsules, um, into the original capsules, is actually a vector. So this vector u, this vector u is multiplied with a weight matrix w, which um, is meant to encode relations between, um, spatial relations between features. So um, in this case, you do the weight matrix multiplication, and W gets updated um, during training using backprop. So the output um, of this layer in the capsule is U hat, which is a vector that encodes different features. The main key element of capsules is actually the dynamic routing, which takes as input um, U hat. So the key element of dynamic routing is propagating inputs on the fly. So for example, if we get an image of a face and um, these different features of a face are encoded using um, U hat. So for example, um, the top one might encode features of an eye and the mouth. So the idea behind it is using um, this learned parameter um, C. So C is also a vector, and it's learned during dynamic routing, not using backprop. So C will encode um, the, uh, how close these features are. So for example, if you have um, uh, eyes and a mouth, they um, will increase C for this particular capsule as it would encode for a face. So how is C actually um, learned during dynamic routing? So you have a dot product between U hat and C, and it passes for a squash function. Um, the squash function not only normalizes um, the result of this dot product, but it would also retain the direction as to um, learn how these features are related in space. Then um, the last key step is um, the C update step. And C is updated by a dot product of U hat and V as in to learn how these features are related. This happens for every single input, which means that each capsule and the output should encode um, its related features. So in the original paper, when they used MNIST, each capsule encoded a different digit and would encode um, features that are relevant to that class. Now, um, convolutional capsules are different in a couple of ways. So first of all, the inputs are no longer vectors. They are now matrices. So these matrices are built into blocks of capsules, and each capsule has channels. So now this passes through a 2D convolution instead of this big weight matrix, which allows us to use much larger images. So the other key difference now is that U ha has extra dimensions, width and height, and so does the C vector, which means that the final output of the capsule will also be a 4D vector. And each capsule is meant to represent um, different features or different classes. So our generator architecture um, is built to be quite similar to a unit. So in this case, we can see that we have um, these Git connections. Um, but 
uh, there's a few key differences. So since our uh, network is a GAN, um, we have a latent vector Z that um, is um, an input to the network, passes through a fully connected layer and reshape to be an additional channel to the input. And the role of this latent vector is to control the output image, which means that if we change the latent vector, the output image will also change. In addition, um, there's another key difference to a regular um, unit, which is each, um, <coughs> each layer in the network is split into blocks of um, capsules, and each capsule has um, a certain number of channels. OK, finally, I'm now going to talk about um, the evaluation of our GAN synthesis model. So we decided to evaluate this network using a segmentation task and a unit that we train um, on different data sets. So we train on either the real data set, the synthetic model that I introduced at the beginning, or the result of um, different GAN models. So we compare our network to an additional state-of-the-art network called pix to pix um, which is actually, the framework is very similar to what we used, um, and is also using a UNAT um, as the generator. We also qualitatively evaluate um, these networks. So our quantitative results are summarized here. So on the very left, we see the, um, the input to the unit. So that's what we train the unit on. And in addition, we also have different labels that we use to train the unit or even to synthesize images. So as I mentioned earlier, we have both synthetic and real labels that we can input to the GAN. So SSM would be synthetic labels that we input to the GAN and SSM uh, and AR would be real labels. So pix to pix um, is the network we compare against, and caps pix to pix is our model. So um, in our very baseline results, that we found that um, PBAN, which is our synthetic baseline, performs the worst, whereas pix to pix and caps pix to pix um, perform uh, relatively similarly. Um, but actually, um, if you just train on real data, we see that performance is actually best in these. Um, baselines. However, if we pre-train on either pix to pix or caps pix to pix data, we see that um, we can improve performance. And indeed, um, if we pre-train on data produced by our model, we can see that um, that's the best performance out of all the different um, experiments. Finally, um, we do a qualitative analysis of features by um, examining the last layer activations of pix to pix and caps pix to pix. Um, so for example, if we um, image the pix to pix last layer activations, we can see that many of the features are actually quite redundant. Um, and it mainly encodes information about the axon class. However, we are also interested in the noise class, which can contain a lot of different kind of structured noise. And we can see that um, as opposed to pix to pix, caps pix to pix, one has much more variation in the type of features it can learn, but also can segregate, for example, um, the noise class from the axon class, which is very important in our case. Another way to evaluate um, the strength of our different networks is to see how much variation we can have by inputting the same label to the network. So since a GAN can vary um, the latent space, it can generate a lot of different kinds of images from the same label. So in the case of our network, um, we can input the same image and then synthesize a lot of different looking images, um, which will vary the axon intensity as well as the noise. However, um, in initial experiments in the pix to pix network, uh, unfortunately, um, the latent space um, didn't really work very well. So instead of having a latent space, they actually used dropout in order to introduce randomness to the network. And this means that uh, the variation um, from when inputting uh, the same label is actually very small um, and is hardly visible in this case. 
Since our network has a latent space, um, that means we can also examine um, the latent space using interpolation. And interpolation will allow us to examine how well uh, our network has captured the axon and noise class um, in our case. So to do interpolation, you, have, um, you, you take two random Z vectors and you linearly interpolate between them. You input the same in image to the network and just input these different Z vectors. So here we can see that um, at, at the very left, our axon has um, two boutons. And as we interpolate, we can see that this bouton disappears. This is one of the key features of axon intensity that we want to tune code. In addition, um, we can see that the structured nodes has also been coded very well in the network and changes across the latent space. When examining um, different features in our network, we can see that um, not only does it capture the, um, the data very well, it also can segregate these different classes. So we can see that, for example, the first capsule um, feature learns uh, about the axon or the boutton intensity. The second one will learn um, about the structured noise, and the last one learns about the background noise. So these are just a few examples of selected features. Finally, I wanted to show um, how this might actually happen um, in the network. So when we're examining intermediate layer features, we want to see how, they, uh, how the capsules group features together. So looking at the intermediate layer features, so these are convolutional capsule um, three and four. So um, each, uh, each different row is a different capsule, and each column is a different channel in the in the capsule. So we can see here clearly that um, similar features are actually grouped together in the same capsule. And since our network is in the form of a unit, um, these are combined later on. And um, we can see that um, important features have been learned by our network. OK. Um, finally, um, I just want to have a little conclusion. So um, we found out that performance segmentation using caps fix to pix and pix to pix um, is very similar, but we can actually improve on segmentation results if we pre-train on caps fix to pix data. In addition, we do this while still having um, seven times fewer parameters. Also, we found that um, caps fix to pix can capture both the axon and noise classes um, very well by segregating and grouping different features into different capsules. In addition, we find that image synthesis is a lot more variable, which um, is actually very important if, for example, we want to synthesize um, an in infinite number of images from similar labels. Um, finally, I just wanted to point out that um, following our experiments that convolutional capsules um, might be very useful for tackling uh, imbalanced data sets, data sets with lots of classes, or even the problem of mode collapse in GANs, as we have illustrated. Okay. Um, thank you very much for listening. I just wanted to thank um, my PhD supervisors and um, my PhD labs. Yeah, thank you very much. The floor is open for questions. We have one in the center, yeah. Is it on? Yeah. Hey, thanks for the presentation. Uh, it's actually three really small questions. First of all, are the results significant in your table? Yeah, they're, they're, yeah they've been tested for significance. Okay. Um, then I was wondering what about just using a simple gun to create uh, more images and use this, uh, use this as, as a baseline? Um, so yeah, we, we tested against pix to pix which is another GAN, so. Okay, and then the very last one is, um, I'm always a bit skeptical about like, the argument about capsules, like you presented the example with the face. Yes. 
um, I have hard times to see how that relates to your problem. Like, I don't see why you need this kind of composition effect so in, in your data. So I definitely agree with you in terms of um, encoding spatial relations between features. We might not find that as interesting as actually grouping uh, features together. So. Actually, the, the main thing that we wanted to test is whether um, capsules or even dynamic routing will be useful uh, in the problem of mode collapse in GANs when we um, want to capture different classes in our data set and be able to actually represent that. So if we, as we see in picks to picks, it actually only picks up on the axon class and it doesn't really represent the noise class very well, which is something we also want to image. Um, but yeah, it's a very good point. So in terms of convolutional capsules that are not able to capture spatial relations between features as do regular capsules, but obviously um, the memory constraint makes it not usable in our case. We have another question here at the front on the left. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, in the original piece to piece paper, it was also mentioned that given the fact that the data set used to train the piece to piece networks, as well as uh, the data set you used to train your games, is that there's a one to one mapping between the segmentation maps and the image generated condition on that segmentation map. Yeah. So, so in picks to picks is also a conditional GAN. That is correct. So. In this, condition, uh, this conditional GAN and in this particular setting, because there is a one-to-one -one mapping, this happens in peaks to peaks, meaning that uh, it ignores the latent and random latent distribution because there is a one-to-one -one mapping between the condition and the target generated image. I'm wondering why the same did not happen for your capsule GAN, but because it's apparently it's what happened for your peaks to peaks version. Yeah, so when I read the original pix to pix paper, um, uh, they said in their initial experiments, they, they tried to add a latent space, but um, for some reason it completely ignored the latent space and didn't learn anything from it. Um, it in my experiments, um, I just used the pix to pix as they presented in the paper using dropout. So um, it, in my opinion, the reason why um, my network didn't suffer from the same problem is because of the dynamic routing of how it propagates um, different features and groups them into classes. So in a way, this, um, this type of method almost imposes it um, to learn these different features um, because it has to group them in similar capsules. If there is no more questions, let's uh, thank the speaker again.